So let's move on to the um, unique value proposition. So, so dead center in the canvas is the unique value proposition box. And this is one of the hardest boxes to get right because it is, it's, a, it's a hard thing to distill down your entire product into a single statement that tells your customers why you're different and worth buying. Now, I also find that a lot of startups initially are not really plagued with this last part. Like the, 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 um, you know, if, you can, if you can get to a point where people are considering buying you, you're already pretty far along. Like the, the biggest challenge initially is trying to find customers who will even pay attention to you. So since the first edition of the book, I've actually revised the unique value proposition and in some ways made it a little bit less ambitious than, than having a statement that people used to buy. But I, I, I kind of changed it from being different and worth buying to being different and worth paying attention. Because I think what the, the real purpose of a unique value proposition is one that customers stop and think about and gives you the permission to then sell them on some of the other benefits or features that you might be offering. And so you'll see an example of, of how that um, kind of gets, gets built in, in uh, real life in this product specifically. So this is a hard thing to build, but like everything, it's a process of iteration. So what we're doing here is trying to take our best stab of what a good unique value proposition might be. And so some, 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 uh, some good tips for like finding those are, for the first one is starting with your, with your early adopters. And that's why the early adopters are so useful because not only do they help you kind of narrow in on which customer segments you should really go after at first, but they really, but, but they really um, let you focus all your messaging and your targeting at them. So if I understand that the, the market I'm going after are parents with young kids, I can actually target a lot of the words, a lot of the language I use just for that audience and not try to go after graphic designers or, or photographers, wedding photographers. So it helps to bring that level of focus. The other thing is focusing on finished story benefits. So anyone who has had a, a basic marketing course understands the, the, the concept of, of talking about benefits over features. You know, customers want to know what, the, what benefits the features provide. This kind of takes that one level further and talk, talk about it from a finished story benefit or from a unique value proposition. And so an example of that would be um, trying to see what, cust what value customers would derive after using your product. So looking at a job, uh, job search board, for example, um, if I had a feature, for ex uh, if I had a feature there where people were able to upload their resume in text, for example, and I had by some magic, maybe I had graphic designers in the back room or something, but I was able to take that raw resume and turn it into a into a professionally designed, unique resume. That's a feature at that point. And I could say, you know, we have got these backroom graphic artists that are going to turn your resume into this, into this, into this, into this great design, into this great, uh, great looking resume that's going to stand out. And that becomes a feature at that point. The benefit there is that you will stand out and so you'll get noticed, you'll get more interviews. That's the benefit. But if I was using that feature for my unique value proposition, I would go and see what value are people really getting from the service. It's not to build a better resume, but it's to get a job and preferably get their dream job. And so the finished story benefit that I might have or a, or a unique value proposition I might put on there is something to the effect of use our service because we help you find your dream job in less than 30 days. And like putting a time frame around it helps to make it even more concrete. But that's an example of what benefit people get after using your product more than just the features and benefits of your specific product. And that ends up being a pretty good compelling way to write uh, one of these statements for your unique value proposition. The other thing that I ask people to like think about is what their product's high concept pitch could be. And so the high concept pitch is something that came out of Hollywood. It's something that um, that movie producers use all the time to distill a big plot down into a sound, memorable sound bite. So if I was a Hollywood producer pitching the movie Aliens, for example, I might not go and I might not talk through the whole script, of, uh, but instead I might tell somebody it's like the movie Jaws, only in space. So it's taking two familiar terms and kind of bringing them together to get a point across. Similarly, in the tech world, we use a lot. When, when YouTube came out, they, they were describing their service as we're just like Flickr only for videos. So it's like taking two well-known uh, concepts and kind of juxtaposing them together to, to, get a, to, to basically get a, a memorable sound bite. And I will caution that this is not the unique value proposition, but it's a, it's a good tool to have when you're uh, talking to customers, especially after you've finished talking to them. If you've got a customer that's excited, kind of being able to summarize your, your concept into a memorable sound bite helps them, one, remember it, but then two, and more importantly, be able to spread it to other people. 
So if you're looking for referrals, which is something we do a lot, it helps you go out there, it helps them go out there and explain your product in their words, but then using that memorable soundbite as a good frame of reference for them. Have you used one? Yeah, so I'll show you the example here that we that we used for, for for that. And then two other books that I highly recommend are these recent trout books. Has anyone here come across them at all at some point? Yeah, they're pretty old. They were written back in the 70s, but they're still like very, very classic, very good books. These guys are considered the fathers of modern advertising. And they they have these 22 immutable laws. It's a it's a book with a lot of white space, so it's a very easy read. And it really has very, very action-packed advice on, like, specifically around value proposition and positioning, um, are are what I found the most valuable for. So one idea there that I haven't listed out here is one is is, is the power of words, or more the power of keywords. And so if you look at every brand, like once you build a brand, after a while, you can you can summarize a brand by just a few keywords, like one or two words. And so I'll illustrate that with an example that I think is in the book. Um, but it's it's looking at the top. Uh, luxury brands um, that, that, that for, for cars that we have and being able to summarize their branding and their positioning with a single word. So if I put the brand Mercedes out there, can you, can you guess what that word might be that's used in all their marketing and all their messaging? Be either luxury or prestige. That would be the word they would use. If you go to BMW, they're more about performance and a lot of their branding is around the driving, you know, the, the joy of driving and the performance of the car. And if you look at Audi, they have positioned themselves around design. And they're still engineering, but still a very heavy focus on design uh, in, in, a, in, in a lot of their messaging and just the way they even present their ads. And so just by showing you how, how those words are powerful is that even in a very competitive marketplace like cars, um, you, can, you can find enough differentiation just by positioning. And that's what this book like, helps you kind of help identify. Now the good news is that those words are, well the bad news is those words are hard to find because they are kind of very specific and they have to be in you know, a unique value proposition. The first part is very true, it has to be unique. It has to be something only you are saying. So if, if um, Mercedes were saying we have a, luxury, like a prestige luxury product and you had another competitor saying the exact same thing, <laughs> it would be, you know, one of them would have to lose because you're both kind of competing against that same positioning, that same messaging. So it's important to have a unique message in there which makes it hard. And the way we try to uncover those words are in some ways through the interviews. So in the interviews, one of the, one of the techniques that, that is very important is one of listening and not pitching. It's not really speaking, but trying to learn. And so when you're hearing the customer recount their worldview, kind of how they solve these problems today, you're actually looking for these key words. And I'll illustrate some examples here, even in my case, where as I was talking to these parents, their worldviews sometimes were very different than mine, and the words that I was using was not even making any sense to them. And so if looking for, listening for those keywords are important because they help to kind of hone in on what those, those words might end up being. So in this particular case, the, this product, as I mentioned, had kind of roots in some technology we had built that made sharing a very seamless process. It was, it was fast, it made the workflow easier. So our staff, from an engineering perspective, um, was, to, was, to, was to basically come up with a unique value proposition around speed. So we thought the fastest way to share your photos and videos would be pretty compelling. And so that's the one that we stuck with initially. Um, and then the high level concept that we came up with was, was, was kind of playing on the fact that we didn't have any uploading when all, when all of our competitors or all of the alternatives did. You had to move these pictures or these photos, these videos up somewhere and that was a time consuming process. So the way that we would tell people what this product was, it was photo and video sharing without the uploading. And sometimes we'd even get more specific. If we knew somebody was using Flickr, we would tell them it would be like Flickr without the uploading step. Or it would be SmugMug without the uploading. You can just replace whatever, whatever um, product you want in there. And so that was our high concept pitch to, to kind of get people's attention. And I, I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll, I'll give you another uh, 30 seconds to a minute here to, to jot down your unique value proposition. And then I'm going to go through, I'm going to fast forward a little bit and tell you how that value proposition worked for us and how we actually iterated and got to something that actually worked better than, than this one. So I'll give you 30 seconds to, to jot down your value proposition.